it is a beautiful thing to be in God's presence, worshiping together. Thank you so much uh, to our praise team. Thank you, Sharon, for that prayer. <clears throat> I want to take you back a few years. It was October 31st, 1996. I was a 24-year-old young youth pastor, not long out of college, ministering on the island of Guam. And I woke up this morning pretty excited. I had a lot of my agenda today, that day for work, and, I, and that was, of course, always in the forefront of my mind. But that day was special because I was going to be driving to the airport on Guam to pick up my then girlfriend, now wife, Amy. And uh, it colored everything I did. You know how you get distracted when you're in love, right? You've been there. Don't pretend like you have. And I, I was on the way uh, to work, and I knew her plane would come in mid-afternoon. And, and, and I, was, I was driving up the hill towards our church on Guam, which overlooks the ocean, beautiful area. And as I, I hear a weird sound on my, on my stick shift, and I, I re look down, and as in the process of trying to get the gears right, I'm not paying attention to what's happening in front of me. And all of a sudden, I hear that worst sound. You know the, that, that sound that you hear that you just ruins your day, the sound of crunching metal? I had rear-ended someone, and oh no, not today. I get out, and I go to make sure they're all right. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm physically okay. We step out and, and flag somebody down to go notify the police officer, and, and so we're waiting on the officers to arrive and do a, trap, uh, a report on the, the incident, and uh, I said, well, I might as well make small talk with this person. We might be dealing some, with some insurance stuff later. So, you know, I said, he's, he's standing there overlooking in the ocean. And I'm like, uh, so, uh, what's your name? He says, Calvin, Calvin Holloway. That sounded familiar to me for some reason, you know, but I couldn't tell why. I'm like, oh, okay, good to meet you, Mr. Holloway. Where, where do you work? He says, I work at the uh, attorney general's office. great. <laughs> I, then I, I proceeded forward and I said, well, Mr. Holloway, that's wonderful. Sounds like a great place to work. What do you do there? He says, I'm the attorney general. <laughs> Even better. Could this day get any better? And so right about that time, the, the officer pulls up with his lights and comes over and immediately I know that he knows, of course, Mr. Holloway, and, and they start talking and schmoozing, and I'm standing back going, I am so dead. I start to imagine what prison looks like on Guam, you know, if there's any island torture methods they use that are different than in this, I don't know, but I knew I was in trouble. What is it like when you offend someone? We feel a little measure of shame and guilt when we sin, right? When we hurt someone we love. Is it better or worse when you offend the lawmaker? The lawgiver. That day, I had run into and caused great personal damage to the vehicle of one who was high up on the island and knew an awful lot about law and helped enforce and carry out the law. What happens when you offend the lawgiver? What happens when you stare into the face of the law and, most importantly, the lawgiver? That's our question today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just ask that you be with us in these next few minutes. Uh, may these words not be mine, but may they be yours. Um, open up our eyes to this important story we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, um, to a passage that almost didn't make its way into Scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 8. This is one of two highly contested uh, passages in Scripture. Uh, this one, along with the end of the Gospel of Mark, uh, are two passages, and the reason they're contested is because they didn't make their way into the earliest manuscripts. Some people take that and they see it as a reason to discredit not just that passage, but some people even go as far as to say, we can't trust the Bible in general. What do you say, friends? Can we? In fact, the idea that there's differing manuscripts and that there's uh, dozens of thousands, 24,000 copies of some manuscripts in, in, in the Bible as actually a testimony to the validity of Scripture. You see, other ancient manuscripts, we may have six or seven or a dozen copies, but we don't have tens of thousands of copies. 
These copyists were meticulous, and occasionally if they left something out for some reason or another, we shouldn't discredit the entirety of, of Scripture. But that's what happened with this one. Some people, the questions on John 8, verses 1 through 11, center more around why it was added later, who the author is. There's not much doubt among strong Christian theologians about the validity that this story actually happened. Okay, it's about Jesus. Some people think Luke may have written it, and it was inserted into John's gospel later for a couple of different reasons. But before we begin with the key character of this, this woman in this passage, we need to back up a little bit to John chapter 7. So start with me on John 7 verse 45, and I want you to listen for a theme. What's going on behind the scenes here as we make our way to the temple in chapter 8? John 7, verse 45 says, Then the officers, these are the officers of the high priest, came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered him, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has ridden, risen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, by the way. This was the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as with many, he camped out like a good Jew in, in a temporary structure made to remember their wilderness experience during that week. But here we find these religious leaders being puzzled on something and questioning things about Jesus. No surprise there. He'd been ministering for a while, and they didn't like it. Their numbers were dwindling of their followers as people flocked to hear him speak, and their pride got a little hurt. The religious elite here are using the law to prove their points. It's really a weapon on both sides, if you notice. One side says, these masses are too ignorant. They don't know the law. We're the ones who know the law. We should be able to interpret things, not Jesus. And then Nicodemus speaks up on the other side and says, oh, yeah, well, you're so knowledgeable in the law, then why haven't we brought him in for a hearing like the law requires? We can't judge him before we hear him. These um, men, religious men, eat, breathe, and drink the law. They have it memorized. They have it on phylacteries on their head. But it's not the spirit of law that they are most concerned about. It's the letter of the law. Jesus had already called him out on this a few chapters earlier, if you remember, in John 5. He told him, he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have what? Eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. They were missing the key character of scripture. So now, they don't have it settled yet, but the Pharisees are determined to prove that Jesus is trouble. And so they call in the only other character here, people group, that we haven't heard from yet that would be the ones to call in, the lawyers of the day, the scribes. Now, they functioned in, in civil means, but here, of course, they were experts on the law, the law of Moses. And they knew and they carefully monitored what, how people lived out this law or didn't. They march into chapter 8 with a purpose. Let's see. Let's pick up at chapter 8, verse 2. It says, now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all of the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Mokeu is the Greek word. It literally means she herself was suffering adultery. She would have been understood by the original readers here to be not the villain in this scene, but the victim. I don't know if it was bad choices for years put together or abuse or, or um, she was forced into the, this kind of lifestyle, but she was a woman who was committing adultery 
and needed to face the music in their eyes. She had been caught. Pastor Mike at Tucker has recently been sharing with us that the definition of repentance is the acceptance of being what? Found, right? And it's a beautiful definition there. But is it possible that you could be found by someone other than Jesus? That's what happened to this woman, right? She was found by the religious leaders, evil men who had no concern for the truth or for the spirit of the law or to know the lawgiver. And they were dangerous. And she falls into their hands. As a little pawn, she falls in. Adultery, this crime she's accused of, is portrayed in the book of Proverbs as the evidence of foolishness and behavior uh, and choices. Though the action has historically carried with it more shame than some other sins, the core issues are really the same. Adultery is, in the end, result of a pattern of selfishness, distracted living, distracted priorities that's exhibited in the culmination of the lust or the appetite. Stoning was the punishment for many things in the Old Testament, as you remember. The Pharisees quote that and say, well, Moses said she should be stoned. Actually, they were only partially true in that statement because there were many different uh, types of adultery and different punishments metered out for each one. And she actually did not fit the definition for a stoning. Stoning was a punishment for apostasy, for blasphemy, for sorcery and witchcraft, for violating the Sabbath, for misusing God's name, and for adultery. Even, even rebellious sons were called upon to be stoned in certain situations. But what we've got to remember is, before you, you say, oh, that's so harsh, is that there were also parameters given, safeguards to protect not only the, the, the person committing the sin, but their victim. There were, had to be two or three witnesses. It couldn't be based on one person. And, and in the example of stoning, the person who, who cast that first stone had to be one of those first two witnesses. They had to be deeply invested if they were accusing someone or wanting to condemn. Even though this lady was certainly reeling and perhaps combative, she would eventually realize that this morning was not at all about her. She was a pawn in the hands of these evil men, much like you and I are when we sin. Have you noticed that? We're pawns in the hands of the accuser of our brethren, whose real target is who? Jesus. By destroying us or shaming us, he hurts Jesus. Have you been there? The enemy knows if he can trip up our families, if he can cause us to offend or to neglect others, then we can hurt the cause of Christ. And that's his chief objective, to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can run one marriage or cause, ruin one marriage or cause one rebellion in one child, then Jesus is wounded too. See what the Pharisees are up to here, though, in this passage? They've done four things. Pretty, pretty sneakily. They've chosen the most public place for the optimal collateral damage to Jesus and his followers. This was in the temple courts, maybe in, even in the court of the Gentiles. If so, there would have been room for tens of thousands. This is a huge court. There would have been room for, for a following of tens of thousands of people listening to Jesus. We don't know what the crowd size was that day, but the Pharisees knew that that was the biggest place where Jesus could gather and teach. And they knew they'd find him there, and they come for optimal collateral damage to Jesus and his kingdom pursuits. Secondly, they disregarded the normal route of justice. They bypassed the Sanhedrin and they went straight to Jesus. They knew that was wrong. Thirdly, they already pardoned the co-adulterer. Did you notice that? We don't see the male in this story, do we? He's not even present, apparently given the chance to scoot out to the side quietly. Perhaps could have even been a religious ruler himself who was involved in the luring. And lastly, they selectively chosen only one of several options for punishment. They chose the most dramatic, severe one, and it was the wrong one for her situation. They are sneaky, and they're trying to set up Jesus. Here she was, face to face with the law, feeling condemned, knowing her sin, but unbeknownst to her, she was about to encounter the law giver. Does that make you, if you were in her place, feel better or worse? The one who created the law, who authored the law, who lived out the law. Jesus was already showing that he would challenge the assumptions of holiness in the law in the Old Testament that they had grown up with, right? He had, many times he had broadened the commandments of the Old Testament. 
Matthew 5, 27 and 28 is an example of that. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already what? Committed adultery with her in his heart. He moves it from the external action to the internal motive and behavior. Man, Jesus, it's a lot harder to control what goes on up here than what happens with what I do. So would Jesus have been a more merciful or a more difficult judge? She's realizing that it's not about her getting stoned by this point. She may still be stoned. She feels condemned. It could happen. The Pharisees will follow through with that if that's what's needed. But they are hoping for Jesus to show his famous, oh, what was it? What's that word that he often exhibited that they couldn't? Oh, yeah, mercy. Waiting for Jesus to show unallowable mercy in their mind. The trap is this. If he says, guilty, you do need to be stoned, then he loses the respect of the people because he doesn't offer hope. And he could be in trouble with the Romans who didn't allow Jews to stage their own executions. So it's a setup. The other option, if he said, oh, don't worry about it. It's full grace. It's full mercy. Go. If he stopped at the word go, then he's accused of ignoring the law and not being a friend of society. You see, their offense in his mind is there was these two things that adultery was, was an offense against. It was offense against God, Yahweh, first and foremost, but also against society. Would he be an enemy of God and society? He can't win, humanly speaking, but aren't you glad that he's not limited to human resources? Jesus does something amazing, and let's look what happens next. Look in verse 6. <clears throat> this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and began to argue with them and debate. Is that what it says? No, are you awake? He stooped down and did what? Wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. He ignored them. Oh, what a, I would have given a, uh, anything to have been a fly on the wall there, wouldn't you? To watch those religious hypocrites stand behind him, looking over him as he's, as he's writing and, and, and waiting and waiting for an answer. Come on, Jesus, talk to us. And they keep prodding him, but he's silent, and he just keeps writing. Now, Scripture doesn't say what he wrote. We surmise and we guess based on the behavior that he was writing down either sins or names or events that would be recognized by those religious leaders because something pricked their conscience, didn't it? And as he's writing there, we don't want to miss the imagery here. He was writing on a slate, which was a slate tile there in the, in the courtyard, which was a flashback to Jesus writing with his finger, God using his own finger to write on tables of stone in the Old Testament. They had come to him saying, Moses said this, what do you say? It's as if Jesus says, oh, yeah, you're, you're superhero Moses. You want to see how close I am to Moses? Let me show you. Let me act like Moses here. And he starts to write on the ground. I'll show you how close Moses and I are, Jesus might have been thinking. But it doesn't stop there with him just writing. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, you can imagine the woman had been cast down at some point in this initial, threw her on the ground in the midst of all these onlookers. By the end, she is standing. Jesus was there's a little footnote here. Jesus was countercultural in how he treated the outcasts and women. Amen? He looked her in the eye. He saw her as a person of worth. He had her stand up, and he's talking to her directly. Any one of those things would have been enough to make her go, what? Jesus loved her, and he had a purpose for her in this encounter. But it's interesting to note before we leave this moment that, that 
Jesus goes down and writes and comes up and down and writes and comes up twice. Where have we seen that before? Exodus. Do you remember the story of the Ten Commandments being given? Moses comes down happily and then he sees the act of immorality at the base of the mountain. And in frustration, throws the tablets down, has to go back up and, and have God rewrite them. Then he comes back down to the camp again. So this back and forth, this, this dealing with the law is, is meant to be an image, a flashback to Moses. Maybe he was trying to teach them something about the beauty of the law and his character. Friends, when we approach anyone with a critical spirit or make assessments about them without getting to know them or giving them the, the time of day, giving them the benefit of the doubt, we act like the Pharisees here. We may not be trying to trap Jesus, don't get me wrong, but we are in danger of having the same spirit. Maybe we want to feel better about ourselves or our title or our position or power. Maybe we just want to make someone else feel bad for once. But the point is, is that that's the wrong side to be on. Jesus knew the spiritual abuse these religious leaders had perpetrated on his victim, and he knew that they led this woman into sin for this day, for a trap, into shame and humiliation and fear, all for the sake of getting rid of Jesus. I must add that spiritual abuse like that still happens today, unfortunately. We live in a broken world, and even God's church is broken. You've seen it. And when it comes to light, God's cause is wounded deeply. But if you've been a victim of spiritual abuse, I want you to know that his message for the woman here today is a message for you too. Don't look at those who have professed to be godly and have acted in very ungodly ways to you. Look to Jesus, the lawgiver. Look into his eyes and find hope and strength. Stephen Armstrong, a teacher down in San Antonio who passed away last year, had a really neat commentary on this, this passage. And he says that when the Pharisees questioned Jesus, they were in effect publicly transferring the authority over to him. By bypassing the Sanhedrin and coming with this question in a very public manner, it was, what do you say? And you are the authority. Well, Jesus took that and he ran with it. And his response shows that. When he comes back, you see, it was with what authority? What did he do with this perceived authority on this issue? He handed it back to them with a condition. You see, Jesus was qualified in that moment to be judge because he was sinless, because he was God. So he hands that back and he says, okay, if you want to judge her so bad, you can act the role of judge. Go ahead. If you've never, ever broken anything in the law, go ahead. Take up the rock. Stoner. And with that high standard, they begin to shrink and walk away. Jesus poured out more grace in this morning moment than many do in a lifetime. You see, it wasn't only the woman who was the recipient of his grace. We must look a little deeper. Jesus, when he was the lawgiver riding down uh, on, the, on the, the pavement, whatever it was, he could have called them out verbally in front of this huge crowd, right? You whitewashed tomb, you hypocrite, you brood of vipers. He could have pulled up some good John the Baptist language, right? And really held him accountable, but he didn't. I'd be tempted to do that if I was Jesus. Good thing I'm not. He steps down in grace and quietly writes in the dust, which could be erased, not like stone, which was permanent. In the dust, it was gone. As soon as the wind came or people walked over it, it was gone. Because he didn't intentionally want to embarrass them. He just wanted them to know where they stood in reference to the law and their need of a Savior as well. Think of how the story could be different today. We might get on Facebook and advertise the, you know, the, the fault. Make passive-aggressive comments on social media and, and try to bring someone's name through the mud. No, nope, not Jesus. He would have no part of it. He, yes... We would shame them, blame them, fight them, and spite them, but the lawgiver didn't. Dr. Margaret Song, a, a physician out in California, uh, writes about Jesus' approach to, to people uh, in general that were on the outcast. And I love what she says. She says, Jesus didn't eat with sinners and tax collectors because he wanted to appear inclusive, tolerant, and accepting. 
He ate with them to call them to a changed and a fruitful life, to die to self and to live for him. His call is transformation of life, not affirmation of identity. Mm. A lot of wisdom in that. You know, we hear a lot about affirming someone's identity today. But Jesus says, no, your, your identity as, a, as, as having carnal nature is pretty bad, pretty messed up, pretty broken. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice in the new identity as a child of God that I can give you. And that's what he wants us to rejoice in. His answer to, to this woman reflects that thought. He tells her, um, if we can jump back, jump over to verse um, 10. He would raised her up and he said to the woman, Woman, where are these accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, she says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Augustine summarizes his comment as Jesus choosing to condemn the sin but not the sinner. He perfectly upholds the validity of the law and the accusations. He summarized it this way. It's as if, according to Augustine, Jesus said, You need have no fear of the past, but beware of what you do in the future. Now observe what I have commanded in order to obtain what I have promised you. Hmm. If any of you have studied science, you know that there's a concept called immiscible liquids. If any of you have done cooking you have noticed this. The most, probably the most dramatic one is you have cooking oil and you try to rinse it out. You pour water into a glass with oil. Does it mix? No. You can see the droplets of oil. You can see oil sink to the bottom or whatever. It, you know, this, 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 these two liquids were not made to mix well. Immiscible liquids. I think the same concept applies historically in our minds for these two concepts that seem to be in competition. They can't mix. What concepts am I talking about? Law and love, right? Truth and mercy. Justice and grace. We see them as opposition and we form these camps, even within Christianity, that are not healthy. We have the liberals and the conservatives. The liberals are all about grace, right? And the conservatives, and I'm oversimplifying it, I know, the conservatives are all about the law and justice, right? And the two do not mix. They are immiscible. But friends, I think we've got it all wrong. I think we've got it all wrong. We shouldn't have camps. Why is it that they cannot coexist? Why can't love and law exist together? With a proper view and looking at Jesus as living it out, they do. Ellen White has a comment on it this way. I love what she says. We won't read this whole quote, but I want to put it up on the screen for you. It says, The law of God from its very nature is unchangeable. It is a revelation of the will and the character of its author. Scooting down a little further, she says, The character of God is righteousness and truth. Such is the nature of his law. Says the psalmist, Thy law is the truth, and all commandments are righteousness. And the Apostle Paul declares the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Such a law, get this, being an expression of the mind and the will of God must be as enduring as its author. Amen? The law is here forever. It's it's an expression of the character of God. I didn't realize until I, I started studying in college and looking at the, the Old Testament commandments, as I looked at them, I, I realized that the Ten Commandments in Hebrew are really a, a lot shorter than they are in English. Most, uh, many of the, word, of the commandments are just two words in Hebrew, and they start out with lo. Lo is the Hebrew negative command, don't. And it's so strong. It's, there's other words they could have used if they just wouldn't say, yeah, you should, probably shouldn't. But what they're saying is don't, don't. Whatever you're thinking, don't lie. Don't deceive. Don't dishonor your parents. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Don't even think of it. It's like a parent standing on the sidelines. Have any of you been there at your kid's soccer game? And you're watching them there early. They're just learning the game. And they're, and they're, they're running. They're running their heart out all over the field, trying to be everywhere that ball is. And you're like, slow down. Pace yourself. 
And you're trying to give them this advice, but they're out there, they can't hear, and they're just running. And you can watch, you can predict what's going to happen. And sure enough, they come in exhausted, burned out, unable to complete the game. We, God is like that loving parent from the sidelines trying to give us secrets for success through his commandments. And many times we run from what we need the most. Jesus could not void the law that day because if he voided the law, he would be voiding himself. Psalms 85 verse 10. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed I know we're not supposed to talk about kissing in church, but here's a kiss you don't want to miss, right? Right living and peace. Mercy towards others without compromising truth. That's what God has called us to do here in this community, in our families, and around the world. Micah 6, 8, you know this. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But say it with me. But to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Isn't that what happened in that, in that courtyard that day? Didn't he uphold justice, do justly? Yes. He upheld the validity of the law. He didn't, he didn't argue about the evil nature of adultery and the pain. He, didn't he love mercy though? Amen. And thirdly, he challenged her to go and sin no more, to walk humbly with her God. It's that verse, lived out. Exodus chapter 20 and verses four to six, in the heart of the commandments, I've got to show you this because um, it it hit me like a a ton of bricks when I read it. We always pictured, I pictured as a kid, the commandments being, man, those are heavy and, and this is a God booming his voice from the mountain. That, but let me read to you Exodus 20, right, right close to the heart of the commandments, right before, uh, right here on, on this uh, commandment, the third one, uh, or second one, it says, you shall, <clears throat> verse 4, I'm sorry, let's go to verse 4, you shall not make, for, this is not on the screen, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And you think, oh, that sounds so harsh, right? God, judgment, okay, justice coming down, not just on me, but on my children, my grandchildren. That doesn't sound fair. They didn't do anything. But then you keep reading in verse 6, but showing what? Mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You see, if God has to choose one attribute, he's gonna say the law is important, it keeps you safe, it reminds you who I am, pay attention to it, live it, meditate on it, dwell on it, but the law doesn't save you, my mercy saves you. And I wanna show you, if I have to emphasize one over the other, I'm gonna emphasize to you that my mercy goes to thousands of generations. I'm so grateful that we serve a God like that. Psalms 103, one more text. I just got to get this in. This is not on your screen either, but it's one of my favorites. Psalms 103 tells us that character of the lawgiver, and it's so beautiful. Psalms 103 is, is a chapter I encourage you just to read when you go home this afternoon if you haven't read it before. Verse 6, it says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Verse 9, but he will not always strive with us. He is merciful and gracious, verse 8, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. For he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who fear him. Oh, come on, I should have gotten a better amen out of that. That's you and I. He loves us. Grace. Mercy when we least deserve it. The bottom line is for this woman caught in adultery today that we see in this chapter today is that the ones who tried to condemn her couldn't. And the only one who could didn't. For as he told Nicodemus, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through me might be saved. Where do you see yourself in this story? If you've ever brought up law in a conversation to prove you're right, to win a debate, to humble a know-it-all, maybe to condemn somebody who you thought was way out of line, then maybe you're like those religious elite leaders. Mercy. Or maybe you've, you have read the law and been inspired to live better, to love more, to be more content, and that law humbles you and brings you closer to God. I hope that's where we are. You don't have to be arrived yet. It's okay. Our lawgiver will get us there. I didn't finish my story on Guam, and I've got to complete that for you. You see, when I was standing there looking out towards the ocean that day, having that wonderful, pleasant conversation with the attorney general, and the policeman came up, the officer, and they talked for a while schmoozing. He, the officer looks to me and he says, okay, you, come with me. We need, and he wanted to take me over to his vehicle. And we would sit in his vehicle, parked in the parking lot nearby, and he starts writing up the accident report. Explain, and he, he writes everything that happened. Then he gets to my personal information. Name, Travis Patterson. Okay. Um, and where do you live? Gave him my address. Where do you work? I said, well, I, I, I work for the Guam Micronesian, Guam Micronesian Mission of Seventh-day Adventist. He said, what's that? I said, it's two blocks up right there from where we're sitting. It's where I was headed. It's my church. He says, whoa, so what do you do there? I said, well, I'm a youth pastor. That beautiful island skin that he had got white all of a sudden, pasty white like me. And as he started the blood rushing out of the head, he looks at me, his eyes get big, and he starts fishing around a little bit, and he goes, and I could see he was troubled on something. I'm like, uh-oh, if I offended him again, what's going on? He goes, um, well, well, you know, and he scratches out the report. He says, we'll just consider this one a warning. And in my mind, I'm like, I just rear-ended the attorney general, and you're considering this a warning? What, what are you, nuts? But I didn't say that, of course, right? <laughs> and, and he looks at me and says, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't feel real comfortable giving religious folk tickets. <laughs> and I started to put two and two together, and I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to like living on Guam. <laughs> this is going to work. Grace was given to me. Do you think I left that parking lot peeling out of there and saying, whatever, guy? No. Grace changed me that day. And I believe it changed this woman. When you look into the eyes of the one who gives the law, who has the power of the law over you, it's intimidating. You look into the law itself and we are doomed. Our little white lies, our lustful living, our dishonoring our parents, our neglect of others, whatever it is, we are exposed like a sudden morning wake-up call with that woman caught in adultery. We are as guilty as her and we're dragged through the streets to face our execution. We hang our heads and admit our guilt and there's nothing that we deserve except for death. But then we look into the eyes of the one behind the law. He lifts our shamed heads and he exhibits his wonderful mercy. He no longer says, there's a solution on the way. I'll take care of that one day. He says, there's a solution that's already been made. Already been made. I've made a way for you. Look up. Live like one who's been redeemed. Go and sin no more. You see, when you look into the eyes of the lawgiver, you find grace, mercy, and hope, and strength. And those are the only eyes that matter.